Hey everyone, good afternoon, good morning, depending on where you are joining me from. My name is Barton Sear. Thank you so very much for joining our another installation of our weekly seafood webinar series. This week, uh, we're continuing on with our series on shellfish. So today, talking clams and mussels, two of the uh, that there are, two of the most versatile, two of the most delicious, and uh, well, yeah. So as any of you who have joined me before know, I like to start off with something that I am thankful for because in these times, well, it's good to express gratitude and uh, I am thankful for the fact that uh, in preparation for today's event, uh, all I had to do was walk down to the end of the block to go down to the rocks with my go clean and got, uh, well, hence the children's sand bucket of, uh, <laughs> in the picture here which is actually full of clams. We did a pretty good job, uh, uh, but also uh, sent in to us from around the country. So we're going to dive in. It's going to be a little bit different here today uh, than other days, as those of you who joined in the past know that my lovely, delightful, courageous, brave, talented, amazing lady fish, also known as Carrie Ann, she is not going to be behind the camera today as she herself is doing a presentation just a little bit later, and so she's doing, a <coughs> excuse me, her preparation. And I'm actually gonna step away and grab uh, some water very quickly. Sorry about that. <coughs> One of the other things I'm fortunate for is they're surrounded by lilacs, 200-year-old lilacs that are just blooming in such profusity right now that um, <clears throat> it makes it hard to breathe and talk sometimes. Anyway, Carrie, my wife, uh, graphic does amazing work. She's done uh, a number of the books that you see behind us, too, If I See, and uh, American Seafood for Cotton Country, some of our books together. Uh, but her work, you can check her out at anemonedesign.com. Uh, and just, hey, I like to uh, shine a light on how brilliant and amazing she is. So given that she's not behind the camera, I'm going to be doing a little bit more kind of in-your-face stuff. I'm going to uh, ask you to work with me if I need to pull you here. And, uh, well, that's that. So let's dive into clams and mussels. I see a good number of you have joined already. We've got a couple of questions on the board already. And I'm going to love to get those from you throughout uh What's your favorite dish to cook with clams and mussels? Hey, have you been to Italy and, uh, you know, you were getting your delicious clam pasta with a little basil on top of it or something like that? And, a nice white, and hey, Parmesan cheese, and he's like, no! I want to hear these things. They're fun. That did actually happen to my wife uh, when she was studying over there in, in college. But, uh, hey. Hey, mussels and clams both are, are such a great ingredient that they really just go with just about anything. So I'd love to hear any of your questions, your comments, your uh, conversation about any memories or dishes that you really love. Uh, and as always, talking from unicorns to tilapia to philosophy, whatever it is. So on the outset, I want to mention and say thank you to a couple of sponsors who have sent up some product for today. We have our friends. Uh, um, who sent us some frozen pre-cooked clams, which is, yes, they're an absolutely delicious product. Uh, we've got our friends up at Maine Beer Company as well. Clams, mussels, and beer are a good thing. And, well, hey, neighbors are also a good thing, and it just so happens that the closest place to buy alcohol to my house is the, the brewery of one of the very best breweries in the entire world that people covet and literally uh, collect and, and wait in lines uh, around the block for uh, to buy. And well, they just happen to be our neighbors and they sent us some product today and uh, thrilled to be cooking with them. Of products and mussels and clams are grown on every single coast everywhere. Uh, and we had some great friends up at Taylor Shellfish, Weston Taylor, uh, next generation taking over that business. So, into <coughs> Totten Inlet and Manila clams, as well as some um, some Pacific mussels, the Mytilus edulis, which is the blue mussel on the east coast as well. And uh, 
We got a we got a big to cover. First thing, muscles, clams, sustainability. Yep, makes for a really good recipe. It really works. Here's why: uh, mussels and clams, just like oysters and scallops, are in, the, in water uh, from their surrounding environments, and from that they filter out little microscopic plants and animals, zooplankton and phytoplankton, and uh, well, those are the just the marine food chain, the phytoplankton, the zooplankton, uh, little plants and animals. <coughs> Excuse me again. And uh, in that way, when a mussel or clam, I mean, they're, they're basically feeding off of the sea. And much like uh, on land, sunlight comes down, hits nutrients in the soil, up comes the grass. That's pr called primary productivity, basically taking the of the sun and turning it into food. Pretty amazing with the nutrients there. Are. That's the same thing that happens in the ocean when you have sunlight coming down, hitting the water, all the nutrients that are there give uh, you know support and life to and zooplankton in the waters. And well, clams are just one slight step above that, clams, mussels, and oysters, and scallops. So they're an incredibly sustainable product in terms of, well, they're, they're operating food chain. So it takes very minimal energy uh, and input in order for us to get them out. The vast majority of clams, uh, and certainly of mussels, and certainly what we eat, are in fact farmed. And in this case, uh, though there are often some differences between farm-raised and wild-caught seafood, uh, and I'm not saying one is better than the other, but in this case, a farm-raised mussel versus a wild mussel, a farm-raised clam versus a wild clam, there really isn't much difference to them at all. <clears throat> other, in, other than to say that farm mussels, farm clams, oysters, well, there's more control in the process. And so we can ensure that they have less grit to them. We can ensure maybe that the shell is the right shape through various mechanisms through their growth. So in that way, farmed uh, mussels, clams, Clams always a patriotic duty to eat as many of them as we can. They are the only foods that I recommend outright overconsumption of because, well, when you support a muscle clam, uh, a muscle scalp farmer, you are supporting the most sustainable food system we have pretty much. So eat up, folks. It's environmentalism on the half shell with a bottle of delicious Maine beer co beer and a bottle of Tabasco. So, uh, right? I mean, this is good stuff. Uh, it's, it's food with not a guilty conscience. It's food with a, a really great conscience. So with that, clams and mussels have long been a part of, of the, uh, and that ranges back to far before this was America. And this is evidenced by middens, uh, basically shell, mounds of shells that were collected from eaten oysters, clams, mussels uh, over the years. And representing e literally eons of consumption of these shellfish from uh, Native American tribes. So long been part of our culture, clams, oysters, more mussels come into vogue. Uh, you may have seen Prince Edward Island mussels you know, on menus everywhere. Uh, well, they were one of the first places uh, in the uh, in the Americas really some land or that provenance of origin became really a, a calling card for mussels and, and really a quality uh, check. But now, well, they're farmed everywhere and anywhere you can get them, we certainly are some all-stars in the field. So with that, let me uh, drop into one question here and then I'm going to start getting into a couple of dishes. Now, because mussels, clams, oysters are, are so versatile, there was so much for me to talk about today that I've chosen just to go with some representative dishes to talk about different methods of thinking about how to cook them. I provided for you a number of recipes right there at the bottom of the window to the right of my name and chef educator there. You'll see event document and references. You can uh, <coughs> excuse me, download those and check out the recipes that we've provided and talk along through. So with that, let's dive in. It comes up from Stephen H. Hi, Stephen. Hey, thanks so much for joining us, buddy. I really appreciate you. Okay, Costco sells bivalves, but I have no idea how to assess quality. Supreme Lobster is the leading seafood supplier. Are they a better source? Hmm. 
Well, let me tell you something. So assessing quality of bivalves, which is, well, that's what a muscle clam oyster scallop is, a bivalve, meaning on a valve. So that snapped open and shut. So when you're looking at a live clam or mussel, and I've got some manila clams here and some uh, oysters over from Totten Inlet or from the way to assess quality is, well, it's really easy. Mussels and clams are usually sold live. If they're sold fresh, they're being sold live and they must be live. So there's ways to tell that. The shells should be unbroken, all right? So that just says that nobody took the bag and chucked it against the wall, right? Nobody wants their food treated like that, nor do the animals. See, and some of them, you are gonna find some little breaks in the shells, such like that. But otherwise, that shell, tightly closed, relatively intact. Now, if that shell was shattered, don't, no go on. <clears throat> but you want to look around at these, and clams are sold by the piece, usually mussels sold in two-pound bags or five-pound bags. Get a broad picture. If there's one broken in the bag, the bag was treated well. There's a whole bunch of them broken in there, just disregard it. The mussels, well, the shells should seem moist, but they should not be sitting in any liquid. All right. And if they see that's great, they should have a sheen of moisture to them. They shouldn't look dried out uh, and generally intact. And the shells should be tightly closed. That means that the animal inside is like, okay, I'm out. stay shut. I'm in my shell. I'm pretty, I'm feeling pretty protected in here. I'm going to stay shut. As soon as they start to open, well, they get exposed to air, which they can totally Totally brilliant. They're used to being in tidal zones. Oh, hi, lovely wife. Oh, she joins. You know what? I think we're actually good. I think I would love for you to just focus on your presentation and have it. I'm all ready. You're all ready? Okay, well, cool. Why don't you just hang out over there then? And just once we start cooking, I'll be all drag you in. Do you want to come over to the side of the camera and say hello? You're so pretty. This is my wife, folks. That's Carrie Ann, and this is our new son, right there, about four, four weeks. It's crazy. Yeah. Uh, anyway, it's what a wonderful blessing that is. So, um, thanks for that. Appreciate you introducing yourself, honey. Um, as soon as the mussel shells be or clam shells begin to open, they also begin to release their liquor, uh, the seawater that they're holding inside, and also their blood, uh, which is exposed in our liqueur that comes in the shell with it. So as soon as it begins to open, they begin to leach that out. And well, you don't want that. It's just, uh, Carrie, would you mind filling up? That would be you. Lilacs again. Um, so you want to see them tightly shut. So Stephen, uh, to your question, look for tightly shut shells, look for moist shells. Uh, also look for general, general good condition of the shells. And they should, of course, be cold, just cold. Uh, they are also sold along with a uh, shellfish tag on, in the refrigerator on the tray. There are two tags. Um, they're often sold with a shellfish tag. They, they have to be by law. Uh, and that tag will tell you what... Um, uh, sorry, that was a call coming in. That tag will tell you when they were harvested, where they were harvested. And uh, that is also somewhat a guarantee of quality that you can you can see right there what the product is. So, hey, Stephen, thanks for that question. Uh, these are the shellfish tags. They, they look <coughs> differently in different situations. But for this here, this is for the gooey duck clam. They totally, I'm going to show you a little bit later. But uh, this was harvested on 6-15, so yeah, just a couple days ago, good, and that was on the West Coast, gotten over to me. Shellfish, though, can last up to three weeks or so out of water. Two weeks is pushing it, um, but don't let that date scare you, because if the quality is there, they look good, then they are going to be good. The farther out of the water they've been, the longer out well they haven't eaten in that same amount of time as well so they're beginning to get some stress on the body so there you go Stephen. all right so 
First thing we'll talk about is cleaning mussels and clams. Uh, at this point, they're both take a little br uh, scrub brush and brush them down. Uh, you get off any little bits of sand or anything on the outside, or you can wash them with a, a powerful nozzle or something. I just took them out with a garden hose and did that. I'm going to find that some of them have what's called the beard or the byssus, as it's called in biology. And this is a, a very, very tough little ropey struck they use to hang on to whatever they're grown from. Clams are grown at the bottom of the water column gener generally. Uh, mussels are grown typically towards the top of the water column and they're typically grown on ended from the surface. And they use these little byssus or the beard to attach themselves to that rope. In order, you don't want to eat this, it is not edible. Um, in order to get you, just simply grab it with two fingers and pull straight out. Try not to drop it as well. Uh, let's see, I can get that off of there. Um, you don't want to clean those uh, too early because that puts a great deal of pressure and stress on the animal. You're basically kind of ripping off its, its appendage there. So you don't want to do that until just before you cook them. And well, it's just very simple and you just keep ripping them off. And I might even ask my wife to do some of that if she's, yeah, yeah you I can. can you can de beard. Awesome. Thanks. If you just, uh, try not to be too noisy, I guess. Mm. Okay, cool. Thanks, honey. So those are the mussels, uh, and you just give them a general wash after that just to get off and it's in there. So most really good quality uh, mussel farmers will, will do a lot of that prior to even bagging them, uh, so there's not a whole lot to worry about. So with clams, very much clams, though, you're going to have more striated texture. On that shell, you can see those little lines running through. Nice thing. This is a beautiful shell. This is a manila clam. Um, so little bits of sand and grit can get in there. So just a little fingernail brush or scrub brush that is dedicated to the purpose of washing vegetables or whatever is more than enough. And just give them a little scrub under cold running water. So that's how to clean them. That's how to buy them. Well, let's talk about how to store them. As I mentioned, one of the great advantages of shellfish is that they last in the fridge for quite a long time. Uh, it doesn't mean you want to buy them three weeks out. Uh, you know. <laughs> but if you're just shopping once a week, hey, picking up two meals worth of mussels, they're going to last in the fridge. Put them in a bowl. Make sure they're as dry. You know, they're not sitting in any liquid. If any liquid bottom exuded from the mussels or the clams, just simply pour that off, give it a wash off, and then put it right back into the fridge. And I tend to store them on to, uh, with a, a moist paper towel over the top just to keep them. Uh, and you want to put them in the coldest part of your refrigerator. So in a drawer where any temperature swings from opening the doors isn't going to affect them greatly. You can put nestle the bowl on top of ice, another bowl of ice. That's a good way to do it. But I don't put the shellfish themselves directly on the ice unless I'm going to use it very soon. And the reason for that is, well, they're saltwater creatures, so don't let them out of cold fresh water. Just not very good for them. So with that, uh, Carrie is just about done here. I'm going to talk about a couple other market forms of clams and mussels. And there were more questions. So uh, my friends at Bar Harbor Seafood, uh, so clams and mussels are, as I said, they're so uh, versatile. They are also one of the, you know, the seafood in form, uh, frozen form, whether it's clam strips, breaded and fried and frozen, uh, smoked mussels, smoked clams in you know, a can, like a can of sardines, or blended into soups, white clam sauce, uh, clam chowder, of course, and then clam juice, uh, which is just the, the liquor of the clam after it's been shucked. And this is a great product for adding instant zest and, and punctuation to a pasta dish with punctuating a soup. Um, there's lots of brands out there. Bar Harbor is one that's produced right here in Maine. So, hey, neighbors, it's good to have you here. Delicious product. So, with that, oh. 
So that's a muscle carry just found that was uh, pretty well smashed up. And that's my fault because I was outside doing that under the hose and dropped them. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Anyway. Okay. Let's take another question here <coughs> from Prue. All right. Prue, thanks for joining us. Hey, I really appreciate you. How can you tell if a clam is good to eat raw? Well, uh, this is one. So there are chowder clams that are basically the, they're the little neck clam that are so large, they're less than three of them make up a pound. Sometimes just one makes up a pound. Don't eat that great. I mean, you can, it's safe, sure. But you can be chewing for a while. It's kind of like big league chew with a nice salty flavor to it. Um, that'll be fun, Carrie, thank you. Wow. So always a fact, one bite size clam. Uh, I do not eat mussels raw. That I just don't like them. There are some people that do. There's not a huge culture of it. Uh, and I generally just don't reckon like them very much. Uh, but with clams, so any clam that you can buy fresh is going to be safe to eat raw, with the exception of the blood clam. Right? That name should scare you away from it anyway. Uh, and those are not safe to eat simply because of uh, it's such an obscure thing. Any clam that you're, I'm not going to get into that. Any clam that you're going to come across, Prue, is going to be safe to eat uh, raw. So again, you're looking for size. You want something that's going to eat easily, eat elegantly, uh, but also something that you can, you know, eat deliciously. Uh, so size. The type of clam really matters. There are things like manila, uh, I'm sorry, mahogany clams, also called the black clam, uh, which even if they are smaller, they're very deep water clam, very chewy, just uh, by virtue of, of just the species. So I don't recommend those either. So I would stick with manila clams, butter clams, uh, both from the West Coast. I'd stick with quahogs. Uh, or also known as the little neck clam family uh, on the East Coast. Uh, and th there's plenty of other species too, but uh, really just look for those two factors. Uh, so in my books, I've, uh, there's a whole lot of information. Clams, as I said, in mussels, there's such a broad category. There's so much information to go over here. Um, so something about the species, as I was mentioning there. So... There's the butter clam of the West Coast, a beautiful white grayish shelled, uh, which has a really sort of the apogee of raw eating, to, to, in my opinion. A really sweet, seductive floral flavor shell that's deep cupped, and so it shucks well and sits in that shell well. Uh, the manila clam, as I've got here, this has just a little bit more of a matured flavor, a little bit more oceanic flavor to it. <coughs> Uh, these go really well with lime, I think more so than lemon juice, if you're going to drizzle just a little bit over. And then on the East Coast, the major species, you're going to have the soft shell clam, uh, which we will talk about, which are these also known as the piss clam or the steamer clam. Not the greatest of names, right? But uh, that's the soft shell clam versus the hard shell or the quahog little neck clam. And with those, you're looking for the size. So appreciate your question and appreciate you joining me. Let's take another one from uh, Shannon. Barton, I just bought your two if I see cookbook. Hey, thanks. Appreciate the support. I keep buying mussels, but after steaming half the mussels, don't open it or this issue. Is this like wine where you occasionally get a bad bottle? Uh, yes, that's true. What I would say is uh, not knowing the exact circumstance. What I might say is areas were a little bit old. And so you have some of the mussels in that batch that were weaker, that had been out of the water for you know, the same amount of time as all of them, but had, had, uh, were just weaker and succumbed quicker. Uh, and so you have half the batch that opens sort of prematurely, if you will, uh, and the rest of the batch doesn't get the time needed to cook. So what I would do is... Uh, yeah, take a look at the shellfish tag. Make sure you're getting freshly harvested. You know, go through all those quality tips and the assessment that I was telling you earlier. Uh, to Stephen's question, uh, but then also, also as, as they go tongs and take out the ones that have opened and put them into a bowl and let those ones that haven't cooked keep cooking. 
Now I find that is very much true with clams that I'll put in two dozen clams all bought from the same place, harvested from the same place, but yet you know, 10 of them will open within five minutes, four minutes, and then the rest of them will take maybe up to 10 minutes. So sometimes there just is that scale. So, but hey, I appreciate again the support. Uh, enjoy the cookbook. It's that's the one we really love, and you get a lot of good good pictures of our house uh, up here in Maine. So thanks. All right, uh, one more from Shelly, and then we'll get into uh, after a bad experience with raw oysters many years ago. I've completely avoided bivalves. I don't want to break that avoidance. So is there a good starter? I want to break that avoidance. So is there a good starter bivalve bivalve recipe? I Shelly, hey, thanks. Um, yeah, a bad experience with shellfish is about as bad of an experience as you're going to get. But um, And so I, I get it. I, I totally get it that you've been turned off to that. Um, I, I myself have had some, some bad ones. But, um, you know, the bottom line is that they are a safe food to eat. Uh, oftentimes, shellfish can trust of the bad reputation as a dangerous food. Um, and yes, there is the consideration that when you eat them raw, there is an increased danger there, but still the danger is just in terms of uh, real danger. So I, you know, I'm sorry you had that experience, but it is an outlier um, in terms of the overall uh, sort of edibility of them. So cooked dishes are the way to go. Uh, you know, to, to get yourself back into it, certainly. Uh, you know, mussels are really a good one because they are so, they, they're available so fresh and um, there's so many ways to, to cook them that the flavor is uh, really adapted to whatever you put in with it. So it's a good, it's like if, if you were, <laughs> If you were to have a bad experience with potatoes, I'd tell you the, the, the great way to start back in is with French fries because, well, ketchup is delicious, right? So cook up a batch of mussels with some white wine and put in a big half cup dollop of some basil pesto in there and just like let the basil pesto carry the day. It's going to be delicious. You can you, you know that for sure. <coughs> so go with what works. That's the best question. I'm going to take a drink of water here and then we're going to come on over and do some cooking. Someone named Shelly should definitely be back at the show. I don't know if you all heard that. But <laughs> anyone named Shelly should definitely get back into shellfish. So there you go. There's your encouragement. <laughs> hey, Shelly, we really appreciate you joining us. Thanks. You're wonderful. Okay, so I've got a pan and heating up over here, thick bottom pan, uh, and we'll bring uh, bring it over to the uh, to the. Uh, stove in just a second. But uh, what I have done here, generally when you are cooking shellfish, what you are doing is you are steaming them cooked. And when you steam them cooked, the result is that they pop open and release from both shells. And uh, what happens also is that then all of their liquor and brine is into the pan. And there's a couple of ways to cook them sort of thinking about this. And then that broth is delicious. So delicious, in fact, that people bottle it and sell it. Um, so cook it for a separate purpose later, uh, like a pasta. Uh, are you going to do it for a cold marinated dish? Well, then great. Uh, you want to temper the amount of liquid you're using. Or if you're going to do an where all of that broth is part of the cooking process, but then also part of the finished dish, you want to think about it a little bit differently. So with that, I'm going to ask my lady wife to come on over here and please feel free to flip around that camera if that helps you, honey. I'm not really sure how, so we're just going to give it a shot. Okay. Cool. Well, I'll show I'm you. Just kind of... <laughs> there you go. Go ahead. Just kind of clean. Kind of clean. Sort of okay. Area. So I've got this pan getting hot. Uh, and the key to this is that you want to cook shellfish quickly. Uh, quickness is going to preserve that flavor. If you boil them down for a long period of time, that flavor can lose its acuteness. Um, and just 
lose a little bit of its angularity. So a, a pan with some good thickness to it that's going to keep that heat and help you boil it down really quickly is essential. So I've got a recipe here today. I'm going to be cooking with some main beer company beer, uh, a beer called A Tiny Beautiful Something. Beautiful name for any product ever made. Uh, tiny Beautiful Something. It is so delicious. If you can find it, I know they're available in like 14 or 17 states now. Please support them. They make great beer, and they're also our neighbors. The mussels into a hot pan. Now, for this, the reason is just that it helps them cook quicker, and I have more control because I know exactly how hot that pan is when things are going in, and I well, I can just respond to it better than getting into a cold pan and then having to wait a variable amount of time. Just put them in a hot pan. So, throw them in, and they'll immediately in, and some of them might even begin to pop open very quickly. Now, the recipe that I'm doing today is with that beer company. I also love, love, love bay leaves. So much so that I buy them by the pound. Do you think that's a... Well, that's about a tenth of a pound. They came out of a bucket. They came out of a bucket, like a two and a half gallon bucket. <laughs> I like bay leaves. I'm going to use some bay leaves in this. What do you think? How about some bay leaves? How about another couple? And by the way, buying a pound of bay leaves is four dollars more expensive than buying a half ounce of bay leaves. Just saying. Check it out online. I've also got some roaster. So Carrie, if you can come back over to the pan, you see that they're just beginning to open up, releasing their liquor here. So I've got some garlic that I've roasted off. Nestle that down in there with the shell. Some beer, not a whole lot, because for sure you want to leave yourself some to drink, right? And then I'm going to pick up this very hot tub. Slices of Meyer left. Put that on. Magic is happening. So, so magical. That's a song called Magical Muscles. I just made it up. Uh, yeah. So that's it. That's basically as, as, as hard as it is going to be. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to finish this off with some butter. I like to actually just add the butter now. There's no reason not to. Uh, and uh, yeah, just add, add a little set of cup of milk, add another chunk of butter in there. That's how you get back to shellfish. Butter. Yeah, there you go, Shelly. <laughs> just add some butter. There you go, all right? I got you. Yeah, thanks, baby. So, with that, what, what's great about this dish in particular is the bitterness of that beer is going to mix with that, that sweetness, that sea sweet, fragrant glory, if you will, of the mussels. Uh, the sweetness of the Meyer lemon, which is in there, but just lemon juice in general. And then that, that sort of musky funk of bay leaves. Just up to this, that was hot. Um, I'm not going to. I'll do that again. I'm not going to do that again. Okay. So with that, I'm just going to keep checking these a little bit. The, uh, you can see the shells are starting to open. Now, one of the things that I have shared with you is the muscle matrix which uh, is in my book, too, if I see. And if I had done my... I would have, uh, it's like around 64, page 64, I'm trying to remember. Well, I pulled it last night. I didn't remember. Yeah, it's page 65, actually. Oh, yeah. yeah. So um, what I've done for you and what we've shared with you, and please, I'd be happy for you to support and buy the book, too. But... Uh, starting off with just what the liquid is. And this is basic um, sort of formulation. The beer or, or whatever the liquid's going to be, whether it's stock water, red wine, white wine, and then just a section of spices or things that go with it that pair well. And obviously, you would never use all of the Herber and tarragon. It's great. Poppy beer with roasted red bell pepper done is great. But you can use this just to get a sense of how flavors marry together, how you're allowing flavors. Uh, so again, that's from 2 If by C. I also provided that for you in that downloadable document. But uh, it's just a nice way to think about how to cook mussels. And that works across the board for clams. But whenever your ingredients are, 
you basically start with your muscles, start with your liquid, start with your hard ingredients, cinnamon, bay leaf, thyme, rosemary, anything like that that's for its food, for its flavors to uh, filter in, you know, marry into the dish. Uh, and then your finishing ingredients. So whether it's your lemon juice, the bell peppers, butter, whatever it is. So, so now almost all of these are open. I like a little bit of thinner broth on these. So I don't do this you know, sort of the French style reduction down to a thick cream. All the before is a muscle that's pulled away from the other shell. Beautiful sitting there in its own liquor. Uh, if you could smell this, you'd smell all of it coming into harmony, really uh, in a beautiful way. So with that, some of them haven't quite opened up. Um, and so I'll give it just a little bit while longer. You see, these aren't overcooking. They're still moist. They're still full and plump. Um, so I'll leave that for just another minute or so. Uh, yeah. And if any of these don't open, I'll just look at them. If, if they seem like, well, like this one here that is just very slightly open, I'll give that a, a little help. But uh, if it is still firmly closed, you know what? I've got enough here. I'll just toss That's it out. always your advice. There's always another muscle. Don't take a chance. <laughs> yep. That's true. So, yeah. Yes. So that's those right there. Serve that with some crusty bread and you are done. It is absolutely delicious. Uh, another dish that I'm going to do and work on while I'm talking. And this will be using a frozen pre-cooked mussel. So I'm going to come back here and uh, ask my wife to, to step back over this way. So I'm just going to to, I just kind of had some ingredients sitting around. We'll figure those out. So let's see. I'll dice some shallot. Uh, and in the meantime, why don't we take another question from Robert? Are the mussels you have there meds? Med uh, uh, Mytilus gallo provincialis, or PEI main, Mytilus edulis. Uh, I am looking for a good size in the. Uh, I think PEIs generally, though, are smaller than sweeter than meds. Yeah, I agree with that. So there's the Mediterranean blue mussel. There are uh, a few other species that are grown, but really it's the Mytilus edulis, which is sort of the major species that we eat in the country. Um, there's also a Pacific blue shell. And, well, they're all delicious. They're all good. And, yes, they do have some slight differences. The way that oysters, different oyster species, have some slight different – have a big difference able to be categorized as oysters and just the way that they eat. So uh, I like the, the blue shell mussel, the Mytilus edulis, the best. Uh, it's really what I do cooking. It's just, it's what grows here wild on the rocks. It's what we pick off and eat ourselves. <coughs> That's what I'm most familiar with. And so, yeah, I like those. You can look to different producers of that. Um, you know, the Pacific ones can tend to be a little bit bigger as well. And these wonderful ones coming from uh, our friends at Taylor Shellfish, uh, which I know are doing online shipping. Check them out. Highly recommend. So, yeah, they're all good. Uh, it also depends on, you know, what you're using them for. If you're going to do a dish uh, like the Moule Eclade, uh, a recipe that you, then, yeah, you want to go with a really sweet mussel that Mytilus edulis, the blue shell. Uh, if you're doing something where you're mixing it with red wine and red bell pepper, fennel seed, and cinnamon, hearty, winter rich dish, yeah, by all means, go with uh, one of the broader flavored mussels. Um, so, yeah, there you go. So, in this one, I'm going to start off with some olive oil. The uh, mussels and clams uh, have been a revelation to me uh, in that. Uh, yeah, I've never even thought about using them until a friend of mine was like, hey, dude, just check them out. Oh, sorry, my wife was pointing me. So I've got uh, these hard shell clams. So these are pre-cooked. Uh, I don't actually know what species these are. Um, so it's a, it's a, like a little type of butter clam type thing. Uh, sustainable, delicious. 
and they come frozen and they're pre-cooked. And when they thaw out, they're going to clamp in them. And hey, man, this is talk about quick. So I've got a pan. Come on over, please, Carrie. What? I've got a pan smoking hot. I put some olive oil in there, sitting around. Got some ginger. I'm also not wearing any shoes. So the splashing oil is going to hurt a little bit. You know what? I've got them over here. I'll throw that in there. And uh, yeah, check this out. Top to another pot on there. Hey, that's it. You know what? <laughs> like literally like three minutes. That thaw out basically, or you could just throw them out in the package themselves. Uh, and just dump them in. Literally, as soon as they're hot, they're done. I'll throw in. Uh, I'll test it for salt. And I'll talk about that in just a minute. And I'll throw in just a little bit of like a, a Calabrian chili paste. Done. I mean, that, that is literally a four-minute meal. It's absolutely delicious, cheap, and it's coming straight out of your freezer, so it is a convenience product. With that, Carrie, back on over here, and then I will free you up and say thank you so very much for your service today. Mm -hmm. uh, I really appreciate you joining me. Would you mind flipping that camera around? Um, there's a little button that has the flip on it, mm -hmm. and then you just flip it around so that I'm in frame. Hey, I think you managed to do that while escaping, showing everybody the that pile of dirty yeah. dishes. That was, uh, yeah. So. Yeah. Awesome. Hey, honey, I love you. Thank you so much. You and uh, hey, have a really great presentation. I know you're going to rock this because you did an awesome job preparing for it. Thanks. So, I love hey. you. So, folks, let's take another question, and then I'm going to show you a dish that I've got in front of me, which is a marinated clam, another recipe that I've shared with you. And we'll talk about soft shell clams and then hey reduct later because it's gonna it's gonna it's gonna absorb your attention i promise you okay amy hi i'm not sure if i missed you saying it do you suggest soaking the mussels before cooking if so do you the one that um i think has somewhat of a legacy uh, in that that information or that tip and suggestion was maybe a little bit more relevant in years past than it is. But the clams, clams more specifically, live uh, near the bottom of the water column. Wild mussels are caught off rocks in tidal zones. So there's a lot of rocks and bits and sands and shell and all that that's kind of tumbling over them at all times. And some of that can end up inside of them. Uh, so to soak a mussel or to soak a clam is to allow the animal itself, the still alive animal, to purge out some of that into. I don't typically do that. Uh, a, because I mean, I have enough and good enough access to great quality product, uh, which, quite honestly, you to shop and have a Walmart or a Costco or a Target near you, you can get great quality cooked frozen shellfish. Um, but any you know, good quality grocery store that's putting any effort, pretty good product. And most of them are purged in some way or at least significantly washed in seawater that will take out a lot of any remaining grit. Uh, so don't soak them. I don't want to take a saltwater animal and put it in a chlorinated fresh water out of the tap. Uh, I just, A, it's not good for the animal it so accomplishes that much um, and there's old techniques you'll hear about soaking them with a couple of tablespoons of uh, cornmeal or something in there and the idea is that the, the, the clam and it spit out everything else and, and then you got cornmeal in your clams it's just kind of weird so uh, it's really about washing them ahead of time finding a brand or a, a Province you or you're buying at uh, that I would recommend for that. Anyway. So hey, thanks for your question. I appreciate you joining us. Okay, another question from Randall. What are some of your favorite West Coast oysters? Cheerio. 
Hey, cheerio to you. Um, that's really fun. So West Coast Oysters, uh, I, you know, I got to say I eat them so infrequently because I literally have four oyster farmers living within a couple of houses of me. Uh, quite literally, we trade chicken eggs from our backyard and zucchini for oysters uh, coming directly out of their two shells back into the water from which they are farmed. So I got to say that I'm not eating a whole lot of uh, Pacific oysters these days. However, next week we're going to be doing our oyster seminar and some uh, some research on those but uh, and getting them. But I really love the Olympia oyster. Uh, it is a species of oyster. It is a native species to the West Coast. And they're small. They're beautiful. Uh, they're like nickel-sized, I mean quarter-sized little oysters. They're wonderful and they're gorgeous um and they just pack all of that bromide slight iodine flavor cucumber melon rind uh but with a beautiful floral back flavor to them and they go west coast oysters i think go really well with lime juice more so than lemon juice you know prevalent but uh hey give it a, give it a shot Give it a try. I mean, you're not going to lose. It's going to be delicious, even if you like lemon juice better. But uh, I found that with all West Coast oysters, so kind of a say which ones do I like, I'll just say how I like to serve them, uh, is to serve them with lime juice, which kind of draws out a little bit of the more sweeter, more floral characteristics of them and downplays a little bit of that glycogen, that sort of sweet uh, uh sweetness to them, uh, but also I think perks up their texture a little bit and gives them a little bit of crunch. But uh, my, my some favorite chef growing just exorbitantly great oysters. Uh, my friends John Finger and Terry Sawyer down at Hog Island Oysters are legends and leaders in the field along with Taylor Shellfish. Uh, Penn Cove Shellfish Company is kind of the threes over there. Um, but those are products that I've long had in my restaurants on my menus and I've always loved and enjoyed. So, Hey Randall, thanks so much for your question. I appreciate you joining so much. And, and Hey, check in with us at the same time, uh, Thursday at two Eastern 11 PM Pacific, uh, to tune into our oyster one. We're going to be doing some fun dishes and have uh, a couple of really great guests with us too. A really cool. Julie and Julie, uh, Jacqueline key. Uh, it's going to be good. Cheers. I hope to see you then. Okay, Sandra. Oh, hey, Sandra. Nice to hear you again. Uh, thanks for popping in. Back to salmon. Cool. An earlier video. Cool. Hey, you know what? I'm going to get back to that. Let's focus on the clam. No, I'll just answer it then. So the Gravlox recipe, um, I'd be happy to share that with you. Uh, I, and we can put that up in an event document uh, at some point uh, and share that with you. But generally it's uh, four parts salt. And I use kosher uh, and specifically kosher salt. I use red box kosher salt um, as opposed to blue box kosher salt. Um, not because one is better than end my entire career using this one. Salting is a physical memory, more so than a constant thing. So when I do, do like this and reach into the salt and instinct, I know exactly how much salt that pinch is going to add to it. This is a different sized crystal. This becomes a different amount of salt. If I were to take that same pinch of iodized salt, it would completely ruin a dish. So I'm not saying use one over the other. I'm just saying use one. It's how to use it really, really well. So I use this, and for this salt, the ratio is about four parts this to one part brown sugar. Uh, and then just add a tablespoon or so of onion powder. Uh, and a teaspoon of ground mace. I'll mix that up, and you want to have enough so that you're going to cover whatever amount of sand you have. You go out a pound and three quarters or so, two pounds, 
Um, you're talking about four cups total of salt sugar mixture uh, and slice thin slice of slices through the skin on the backside. You definitely you need to have the skin on. <clears throat> and that's just so that the, the slices are scoring it so the salt can penetrate that side as well. And then put the salt sugar mixture on top of it, add any flavorings you want, whether it's tarragon, citrus, rosemary, thyme, dill, whatever, and then wrap it tightly in plastic wrap. And then, and then flip it or so about every 12 hours or so. And depending on the, the, the type of cure you're looking for, the texture that you ultimately want to achieve, uh, will lower. Up to about 36 hours is as far as I will go, although some places will do, uh, you know, for a traditional European style breakfast salmon, we'll do up to three days. Cool. All right. Let me talk you through uh, this one dish and then talk you through soft shell clams. So these manila clams, soft, sweet flavored, a little bit more where they've got those beautiful shells, as I was saying, and these have dried out a little bit post-cooking. I mean, just how gorgeous is that, right? The mottled shell with those lines, you know, perfectly gray, violet going off. I mean, it's just, it's beautiful, right? Um, so I have cooked those open, and once they were cooked open, it's a simple action to just peel it from the shell. And by peeling it from the shell, you want to get all of the animal and you want to leave it intact too. You don't want to rip it apart. Uh, for example, well, this here. So when you make errors constantly, really, um, you can see I've left some of it in that shell. A, you don't want to waste it, but then also if for this dish in particular, that doesn't really look so great as sort of, so I've pulled those from the shell and I've saved the shells for the serving. So I cooled them down. I poured off the broth that they cooked with, and I'll use that for a separate purpose. And I've poured it into a, a clear beaker so that I can see as sediment, sediments out. So any little particles of grit or dirt or anything that are in the bottom, do it there. Yeah, you want to let that settle out. So just give it a few minutes, maybe an hour or so, and just let that settle out. And then you can pour it off, much like kind of pouring a fat off gravy or something. A uh, little bit of sediment in there. And that's the reason why you don't necessarily want to cook your clams into your pasta, because if there is any sediment, you've lost the opportunity to get it out. It's now integrated into your pasta. I... I recommend sort of this par blanching, par cooking method. You just have more control over it. Um, you have more control over the presentation, over the flavor, etc. So with that, now that you have the steam and the broth, you can do whatever you want with them. And one of my very favorite things to do is then marinate them and serve them chilled. I will even mix them with mussels that I've cooked in the same way and do a little mussel and clam. There's a great Spanish cabbage. Uh, where it's they're then marinated, the cooked mussels and clams are marinated in carrots and celery, onions, coriander, uh, cooked down in a ton of olive oil. Uh, added in right at the very end, then a good healthy shot of sherry vinegar. Woo, man, so good. And some of the mussel cooking liquid. And then they sit in that marinade overnight and are served with you know, big chunks of the carrots and everything on top. But one of the ones that I've got here, and I used to do this in a very effective, very delicious little appetizer, great for entertaining, is I then marinated the clams or mussels pulled from the shells in pine nuts, uh, lemon juice, and olive oil. And it's no more complicated than that. I'm sorry, I can't really give you the overhead view, but hour or two hours. I made these just before uh, we went live today. And then you want to just spoon one clam right back into the shell. Make sure you get some of that great marinade. And there you go. There's you some of that kosher salt. Put that down as a, a layer for the clams to nestle into so that they maintain 
upright, so you get all that juice. And man, that's really good. Yeah, congratulations, Weston Taylor from Taylor Shellfish, because that is a fantastic clam to begin with. But mint, let me tell you, man, mint and seafood, it's just perfect together. So with those, you can make those up to a day in advance. You might not put the pine nuts in until closer to. Sometimes I will, sometimes I don't. But they will absorb some of that, add just a little bit of texture. That's fabulous. So, cool. All right. Back to salmon. Another one from Sharon. Hey, Sharon. Nice to have you joining us. Using mace as a spice for salmon. I finally sourced some mace where I live. What other flavorings do I put? with it for salmon and do spices go on just before baking or with the salt 15 minutes before cooking? Great question. So with mace in particular, uh, mace is a, a spice you, you do need to be careful with because it can greatly overpower a dish. However, it just adds such a subtle and seductive, very elegant uh, sort of platform for a dish. I think about mace this way. You've gone to all the trouble getting dressed up for your black tie event. I mean, you have put on down to the nines. You are dressed up a little, Sharon. You are just rocking it. And man, is your outfit put together. And that mace is that little dab of perfume right there that when you walk through that door, every single person's going, wow, look at her. That's it. The mace is what just catches people's attention. It's just like, Gotcha. I gotcha. With that one little last little bit that just throws it really wonderful. So a small amount goes a long way. And yes, uh, when using it just as is, I would mix it with the salt uh, because so little is needed. I would mix it with the salt and then get it uh, evenly distributed. Um, and uh, I'm actually going to have to go a little bit early here because my kiddo is yelling for his mom and she's got a big presentation to do. So dad ask squid here in a minute. But um, so, yeah, that's a, a good way to do it. But it also pairs beautifully with lemon, uh, lime zest as well. Things that brighten V8 flavors. So dill is really great. Uh, it also goes really wonderfully with cilantro. Bright, beautiful, clean flavors. So, hey, Sharon, thanks. And I really appreciate you taking some of uh, uh, that. That's It's really flattering, and I really hope you enjoy it. And please tune in again and uh, let us know how it turned out for you. So I'm going to take just one more question here. And then, as I said, I got to go be a, a great dad and uh, support my lovely working one. Last question here, please, uh, Patrick, maybe we can save the questions, my colleague, for, uh, for next week uh, or answer them in writing. So the last question here coming from our friend Enkele, 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 what a beautiful name. I've never heard such a name. That's wonderful. Thanks for joining us today. Hey, we really appreciate you. My apologies have been asked before, but are mussels and clams generally easier to overcook compared to beef or chicken? Uh, yes, they are easy to overcook like any other protein or anything. However, uh, they're also very easy to show that, to know exactly when they're done and pop open. And as soon as they pop open, they are done. And so just a casual glance at a pan can tell you, okay, we're good to go. So in that way, it's almost a foolproof seafood to me, whether it's on a grill. Uh, there's a dish that I included a recipe for, whether roasted over pine boughs, which is a really, really cool dish uh, called moule éclade from the Breton coast. Uh, but whatever it is, as soon as they pop open, they are done in that way, offer you a lot of control. So with that, I'm sorry that I'm not going to get to the rest of the questions, but hey, we live in a, um, in a new going to show you this one last thing because I don't get these very often and you don't get the chance to see them very often, but I hope I don't leave you with a nightmare. Ladies and gentlemen, the gooey duck clam. It's going to keep getting longer too if I keep holding it. Y'all ready? This one's crazy, right? That's a clam! So all of that, that's the siphon. This is the siphon shaft. Uh, 
There is a really great webinar, a really great little tutorial on chefsteps.com on the Gooey Duck. Patrick, maybe you could find that for us and post that. Chef Steps, Gooey Duck, G-E-O-D-U-C-K, spelled like G-O Duck, Gooey Duck, though, is how it's pronounced. Uh, can be, they need to be blanched first and then sliced open. You can eat them raw at that point, or they can be sliced thin, stir fried, mixed into salads, marinated, stewed into chowders. There's multiple different parts of the meat that add their own different flavors and textures. So with that, uh, questions, a lot of fun. There was a lot to go over. And so I depart uh, with regret from you today. But thanks you all for joining us. Please join us again next Thursday, same time. We're going to be happy to take back to you. And with that, I love you all very much. Stay delicious. Keep feeding people. Feeding people is an act of love and kindness and of neighborliness. The world needs a lot of that right now. Thanks for all you're doing. Thanks for joining. Wish you well. Take good care.